those resources available to you for our worship time. If you haven't found those yet, go to rogersbaptist.net. You'll find them up near the top of the page where you can download those. That'll have your uh, words for the songs this morning, a worksheet for the, the message, as well as some resources for the children and today's bulletin. So go ahead and get that if you haven't. And join us wherever you are and standing as we sing, Who You Say I Am. Am I that the highest would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me his love. Lord. His love. Lord. Who the sun sets free. child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. great truth to remember this morning. Thank you for singing with us. Please be seated. Good morning. I trust you're up in Adam. Everybody's ready to worship um, the Lord this morning. This is the Lord's Day and first day of the week and every Sunday is a celebration, a recognition of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And let me just say this, you are as welcome as the flowers of May. Here we are on May the 3rd. Uh, and so this is a month of transition, we're being told. Just uh, how fast that transition will be, I don't know. But meanwhile, we have a continuation of uh, our worship in the, the, in the present mode. And as children of God, members of this church, regardless of where we are, whether we were on vacation, where we are, it's the first day of the week. We are honoring the Lord Jesus and giving him our hearts. This May, uh, in our light zone, uh, let it in, let it out, church focus, we're, we're centering on a different kind of light. We have a different focus, a dinner each month. And so this month, it's floodlights. It's being floodlights. 
living with open hands and open hearts. You say, well, what is the floodlight? Well, we know that. It's that broad beam, high intensity uh, light. Uh, it's just the opposite of a nightlight. You know, a, a nightlight, its purpose is not to flood the room with light. That's not good. That's not its purpose. It's discreetly to shine just enough light in the right places to keep us from stomp, uh, you know, stumping our toes at night when we're up going back and forth. So uh, floodlights, that's a totally different thing. You know, you can see the, the stadiums, football stadiums and such, uh, in the evening because there's this high tier of these floodlights basically transforming night into day. And we can see it in our city parks with these wonderful lights that illuminate soccer fields and baseball fields so we can play at night. So floodlights, well, what are they? They are generous. They're not stingy with light. They are generous with light. They're, they're just wide open. And so we think about open arms and open hearts. And so like floodlights, Christians should be generous. Floodlights are generous with their light. And as Christians, we are to be generous, uh, flooding our world, whatever that world is, however it looks. And it looks kind of weird now. You know, we've, we're walking different paths, but that's not a bad thing. It can be a good thing. Uh, so we're flooding our life with our lives with love, God's love, God's light, and with open hands and open hearts, we God can use us, especially uh, these months, uh, illuminating the darkness of discouragement and the darkness of sadness. And boy, there's a lot of that out there. And yes, unbelief that is around us. And so, here's the deal: God has blessed us. And so we gush God's blessings on others. We flood God's blessings. God has given to us the greater things. You can make a list of things that you don't have right now. And maybe you're one of those who's been furloughed. Or maybe you're one of those, one of those, one of those. Yes, yes, yes. But even given that, our greater blessings and gifts are the kind that are never, ever threatened by government. Never threatened by anyone that, that, are, that are eternal and those are the blessings that we need to really focus on and celebrate. And so God's been good to us. We'll have to admit that. His grace. And so we ought to, we've been given. And so we ought to give. We ought to flood our lives as floodlights. And so as we go through this month, keep that picture in, in your mind. And we all will as we go through the month of May. We're not making a lot of prayer requests or anything, but I, do, I know that Bob Jones, uh, pray for him. He's been diagnosed with prostate cancer. So that's, that's he's, he's doing good. God bless him. He said, Brother Ron, God knows. But pray for him and his journey. Uh, George and Helma Vaughn, uh, Helma's been in and out of the hospital. So they're back home now, and she has some other tests. Keep, keep them in mind. And I want to bring you this news. Uh, Travis Gilbert's dad, Brother Jim, you know, Jim and Jan Gilbert, they're just so dear to us. And brother, his dad, uh, brother Jim Gilbert, has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And that just came to light this last week. And um, I know this, they're dear to our church. And um, I talked to brother Gilbert this week. So would you pray uh, also for that family? And uh, also Nona Dockery's having surgery on the 19th of May. So. There's always this always time to pray, and we should always consider one another. We'll have our full list. We have our latest prayer request this Wednesday. Let's begin. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us first in Christ Jesus. We thank you for all the gifts, the grace that you've bestowed upon us, specifically through Christ our Savior. May we choose to be thankful. May we choose to be uh, giving. Uh, may we choose, dear God, to be our servants today. We have so many choices. May we make the right ones by the leadership of your spirit and the instruction of your word. As we enter in this day, let's put the world behind us, O oh Lord, and let's focus on your word. Let's worship in song. And Lord, let may renew our hearts as we're here together. Bless us also as we take this time online or whatever to give to 
back to you, back to your church, and bless that in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, it's exciting to tell you that this week our routine is going to take a little bit of a break from what it has been. And uh, so when you look at our week at a glance, there's some changes that are coming up in this next week. And I want to point those out to you. First is that tonight our youth class is not meeting on Zoom. We are going to uh, take and have a parking lot meeting tonight for youth and their families. This is an important time for the entire family to come together for this. Um, youth will need their parents and specifically their parents' cars with an FM radio as part of that tonight to be able to uh, participate. So parents, if you can accommodate that, we know they need a ride there, but instead of dropping them off, we need you to stay in the car with them. This is actually intentionally for the whole family. So we've got something for all of you, including a, uh, a special activity for your family at the conclusion of our class time together. So please plan for that at 6 o'clock in our parking lot out here closer towards our gym. You'll see us set up there when you arrive tonight. On that same note, next Sunday morning is going to look very different for Rogers Baptist Church. Rather than us broadcasting from here inside this room to all of you at home, we will broadcast, but it will be from outside in our parking lot. We're going to have a stage set up there, and we are inviting you to come, and if you're able to, to join us from your car Tune your FM radio. There's instructions in your bulletin this morning about that. Uh, we ask you to plan accordingly to the fact that the restrooms are not really open to the public. They're just there for emergencies. So uh, plan accordingly, but arrive between 10 and 1025 Sunday morning. Uh, we're going to have some people that will direct you towards a parking space. You'll enter off a of Wakefield Drive. We will get to where you need to go get you the things you need, including a special gift for all of our ladies uh, in honor of Mother's Day this coming Sunday. And uh, we're going to celebrate together the fact that we're able to meet in that fashion. And uh, you can also, if you haven't already received it uh, in the mail, there was a physical copy mailed out to all of our members about our uh, plan as we go through phase one for Rogers Baptist Church. You might have received that by email as well. But if you are a member or a regular attender of this church and you did not receive that for some reason, you can contact our office about that tomorrow, and uh, Miss Cheryl would be happy to get that to you. Uh, but we need you to read that and to be preparing for what that is going to look like as the, the weeks come and knowing what that will be. So uh, do your homework, do your reading on that, but plan if you're able to to join us next Sunday in the parking lot for that special service. Well, we invite you to go ahead and join us now in singing Build My Life. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only name who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. praise we could ever breathe, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name, 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you.
Father, Lord, we come before you this morning, and Lord, we give you thanks for providing truth to us. Lord, we give you thanks for the fact that you have given us both written word, but also your son, Jesus Christ, who came to demonstrate and be the word, the truth in, in flesh for us. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are unchanging and that we can trust you in any circumstance. Lord, we give you the glory and the honor this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
our streets be filled with joy. May injustice bow to Jesus as the people turn to pray from the mountain to the valley hear our praises rise to you from the heavens to the nations hear our singing fill the light shine in the darkness as we walk before the cross may your glory fill the whole earth as the water o'er the sea from the mountain to the valley, hear our praises rise to you. From the heavens to the nations, hear our singing, fill the air. From the mountains to the valley, hear our praises rise to you. From the heavens to the nations, may our singing fill the air. Austin Tozier, would you lead us in a word of prayer? When you speak, confusion fades, just a word, and suddenly I'm not afraid, cause you speak, and freedom reigns. There is hope in every single word you say, I don't want to miss one word you speak. Everything you say is life to me I don't want to miss one word you speak Quiet my heart, I'm listening When sorrows roll and troubles rage You whisper peace When I don't have the words to say When storms won't break you keep your word, oh, and your promises will keep you safe. I don't, don't want to miss one word you speak, because everything 
say his life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. So quiet my heart, I'm sheets and uh, kind of give some insight into we have we we're without PowerPoint so with this it's taking its place for right now has its advantages actually I think so I trust you've got that we're uh, making our way through the gospel of John and uh, I've entitled what we have for you this morning is Jesus declares the truth Jesus declares the truth. Through truth, there are several things that weave their way through this passage we're looking at this morning. And the word truth is certainly one of them. In chapter 8, verses 31 through, 30, through 59. 31 through 59. Uh, we live in a soundbite world. We, and uh, un unfortunately, we don't get much in depth. And people, we can be manipulated by soundbites. We can be misled by soundbites. And it's, it's, a, it's a kind of affected all of us that way. We just want the short, the synopsis. And um, many times, I think as Christians, we, we're soundbite uh, when it comes to the Bible. We, we know certain chapters we, by one verse or Psalms or those. And certainly, uh, it's like the chap this eighth chapter of uh, John. We know, uh, he that was out sin, let him cast the first stone. But we don't, don't seem to know the phrase, go sin no more, that, that seems, does not seem to echo. Well, in today's text, it's, uh, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall say, that's all we know. And unfortunately, as pastors and preachers sometimes, that's all we preach. Um, but one thing about approaching the Bible, uh, it, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, is uh, to take the bigger picture and, and not just give one verse in a psalm, but so it's context. And so that's what we're attempting to do. I really struggled. We've got a lot. Verse 31 through 58. Um, it's a challenge. Um, it's not an easy chapter. The gospel of John is very theological. God would not give me a liberty, but anything doing what I'm doing today. So I think we can all be, uh, I'm preaching this maybe differently. It, within the context of the, of the gospel of John. Now our text passage contains really what is the culmination if you've been with us for a while, this started in chapter 7 and it goes through chapter 8. But uh, what's known as Jesus' Feast of Tabernacles uh, discourse, which he made in Jerusalem just six months uh, before uh, Passover, the Passover feast. 
and his crucifixion. So the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, we know already, if you've been with us, is a memorial uh, to the wilderness wanderings as um, after the, uh, Israel's exodus, right? There's a whole book there, Exodus from Egypt. And so in Jesus' discourse to this point, he's talked about himself in relationship to the Feast of Tabernacles and that wilderness. For example, he says, uh, I am the bread of life. He, he referenced himself, right, as the manna. And he used it to talk about coming down from heaven. You know, my origin is not Nazareth. My origin is not Mary and Joe. My, you know, my flesh. I, I'm the bread come down from heaven. So manna, I am the bread of life. And then he takes up the theme of this water that flows from the rock that was struck by Moses. And he says, if any man thirst, let him come. Drink of me. And then he says, if you drink of me, uh, out of your belly will come rivers of living water. Uh, you know, and, and spoke of himself as the water. Uh, and then in verse, the third thing he does is, uh, I am the light of the world. And uh, the light shining there from the pillar of fiery pillar of cloud in the wilderness. And he says, uh, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have. So Jesus has used the wilderness wanderings, uh, reflected in the Feast of Tabernacles to express these vital, vital truths concerning himself. So as we approach this passage, keeping with Israel's wilderness journey, uh, the passage before us mirrors the mixed people groups who followed Moses on the way to the promised land. And that, that's just so evident here. Back in, Moses, back in Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, those who followed Moses and those who followed Aaron out of Egypt in, in Exodus 12, 38 are called a mixed multitude. The Hebrew word for mixed there can describe anything that, uh, like cloth that's woven with different threads as being mixed, okay? Diverse types of threads. A crowd consisting of diverse types of uh, ethnic groups and ethnic origins can be a mixed multitude. But also, it speaks of a mongrel race. And that's actually going to come uh, into our text later on. And we'll talk about that. A mongrel race, that is, uh, the people who are born to parents that are different ethnic groups, okay? Most Bible teachers view the group here uh, in, in Exodus 12, 38 as a mixture of other nations who decided to just join the Jews and go with the Jews out of Egypt. More specifically, some Bible commentators say these are Egyptians. And you know, when you read that journey, it says, oh, why have you brought us out here? Wish, would to God we were in Egypt. Oh, I could just taste the, the leeks, the garlic, you know. And they begin to talk about wanting to go back to Egypt. So that's kind of what was in this particular, particular time. Now, uh, a recent census taken in America reflects the changing face of our nation in that it offers more options to specify our race, our ethnic identity. And, uh, but then what really complicates matters is the reality that more and more Americans are a product of interracial unions, uh, inter-ethnic marriages and unions. And so for sure today, America is, is a mixed multitude, uh, not just in the sense that uh, we're a, um, uh, you know, a representative of, of every group, ethnic group, you know, but we're also a melting pot, you know. So we're, we're fusing together, you know. And so I, I got to thinking about that and God's people in all of this. And uh, I thought about the throne of God in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. You know, and they're around, the saints are there. And one day project, you know, that's where we're going to be. And what about that group? Well, it's going to be a mixed multitude. There's going to be in every tribe, every language, every people, every nation, every ethnos. So, you know, how we think about our world, how we share the gospel and share God's love, we're the, we're the floodlights, we gush, we broadcast. You know, that ought to reflect, you know, what, how we are now and how we administer the gospel. If you ought to reflect that scene 
around the throne of God. Racial and ethnic identity aside, the Bible teaches us that, now listen, it's our spiritual identity that matters the most. I mean, it's just so clear. In, in Romans chapter 1, verse 6, we know that passage where Paul makes it clear that God's salvation in Jesus Christ supersedes any kind of national, racial, or ethnic identity. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God uh, unto salvation. To what? To everyone that believes. Notice what he says. To the Jews and to the Greek. Now that word Greek, you know what that is? That's just that's where I am. It's where most of us are. Non, whatever's non-Jew, that's where we are. It's in other words, Christ is for the nations. The difficult task before us in our text passage is kind of discerning Jesus' audience. Jesus is speaking to a mixed multitude. He's in a non-racial or non-ethnic sense. I want you to get that. He's speaking to Jews for sure. Yet, there are Jewish believers and there are Jewish unbelievers in his audience. Have you got that? Let me break it down even more. There were Jews who were committed to Jesus, Jews who were simply curious about Jesus, and then there were Jews who absolutely hated Jesus. And this described the mixed multitude in our text passage as it was in the wilderness wanderings. Now, as we start our passage, the, at first, Jesus' words are directed toward Jewish believers, those who are committed to him. Look in verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Okay? So he's, he's primarily talking to these people. And what does he say? He says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So beginning with these who profess to believe in him, Jesus issues this call to discipleship. Interesting word, the word disciple. Actually, it means to be a pupil. It means to be a student, someone who learns. Jesus, come unto me, all ye weak or heavy, uh, weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Then what does he say? Take my yoke upon me and what? Learn. Learn of me. The, taking up on the yoke of a teacher or a rabbi means to listen and to believe and live by his word. So a disciple of Jesus Learn is one who learns is a pupil and continues to hear, continues to obey his teachings or his word. So the evidence of a true believer is an interest in and a commitment to God's word. You got that? I mean, that's huge. I mean, a true believer will have ears for truth. You'll see that all through this passage. A true believer will have a heart for the Bible. I mean, this is a, by the way, this sentence here uh, it, it, on disciples, it's conditional. It says, if, if. So if a believer does not, a professing believer, does not continue in Jesus' teachings, then he or she might be one who just simply professes faith in Jesus rather than one who possesses faith in Jesus. You see in the mixed multitude? I mean, he, he's breaking it apart. And right here, he's with discipleship. Now, this spring, the, the uh, coronavirus has released students early out of our schools. And they've sent them home, right, to be online learners. To continue, continue, listen to that word, their education online. And I dare say that this development has separated students who are interested in learning from those who are not interested in learning. And true students, my disciples, I want you to get this, true students will continue their school lessons while students in name only will fall behind. I've known some administrators who have gone and visited their students, uh, school students, that are not doing their lessons, knocking on their doors and talking to them. Why are you not learning, okay? And so you think about that. Um, 
uh, true students will continue in their education. And by the way, true believers will not be deterred in their spiritual lives and their commitment to God's word when they're not able to assemble, when they're not able to attend church. And some of you, some of us, maybe we attended church, but we still didn't. We weren't very good learners. And we took, maybe we didn't take what we do right now and are not able to do very seriously. True believers will find a way to continue in God's word in their personal walk That's what a true disciple is. Now, Jesus goes on in verse 32 to state the implications of being a disciple of Jesus. Okay? He says, and you shall know. Okay, this is predicated on if. If. The word meno in the Greek. Meno. Continue. If you can. If. It's a big if. But if you do, well then this is the consequence. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So there's a natural progression here expressed by the words know, which is a knowledge based on experience, truth, which is seeing things as they really are. Boy, that's so needed in this culture of deception. And then third, freedom, or the absence of constraint. So I want you to think about it. And these three words, these three words imply spiritual progress, spiritual growth of a disciple. A true believer continually, if you continue, will continually move from ignorance to knowledge. All my life I've been in God's Word, but I'm still learning. I want to always learn more and more. So it's a continual thing from ignorance to knowledge. And then from a distorted, confused vision of ourselves and this world to a clear vision of who we are and how this world world is. I mean reality, the truth, right? And then from a life of, re, of restraint to and defeat in pursuit of God to this freedom, this wonderful release this wonderful liberty to move through a life of fulfillment and a life of purpose in Jesus Christ. And so we see this, you know, salvation, regeneration. It's just the beginning of our walk with God. What follows regeneration is sanctification, which is enabled by discipleship. So increased knowledge in God's word was such increased conviction of truth, which will transform our lives, resulting in increased freedom from sin. To pursue God. That's all here. That's all here. You see that? You know, knowledge, truth, transformation, freedom, growth, liberty to go. Uh, Paul in Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing. That he which what? Hath begun. Begun. Okay. Good work in you. Will what? Perform it. Minnow. Continue it. You know, until the day of Christ Jesus. We're all a work in progress. And if we're disciples, we're on a journey of, toward Christ, Christ's likeness. And so this is where the mixed multitude begins to attempt to sidetrack Jesus. And there are actually four points of argument that directs the flow of Jesus' teaching. He kind of follows it. And in the process, begins to reveal who believes in him, who merely professes to believe in him and who seeks to destroy him. And you just, you just see it as we move on through this text. These four points of resistance play a very important role in the salvation of a soul. And so we will identify these four arguments presented by unbelieving Jews as the heading, their lies against the truth. Are you there? Their lies against the truth. So let's just block them out for you as we go right down this passage. First, their lies concerning the reality of sin. Now, the issue of freedom immediately sent these unbelieving Jews on attack. Notice verse 33. They answered him, oh, we are, we be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest you that we are are made free? So these self-righteous Jews 
are so proud to be descendants of Abraham and thereby, in their minds for sure, uh, the greatest race of people on the earth. And they're so proud in their Hebrew heritage that they're con they have conveniently forgotten parts of their own history. You know, what about the slavery in Egypt thing? You know, and what tabern Tabernacles is all about? Uh, what about those oppressions of the Jewish people in the time of the judges? What about that 70 years in Babylon? And by the way, I could even mention Persia, and we could go on. What about their present dominion by the Romans? And being dominated, slaves to the Romans. Listen, these Jews boasted of never being in bondage to anyone. But then Jesus, oh, he's so good. Verse 34, he just turns it and he answers them. Truly, truly, I say unto you, whosoever commit a sin, ah, look at this, is the servant of sin. So Jesus is speaking of a slavery that's inflicted from within not from without. That word sin is a verb tense that describes habitual sin. So sin is the transgression of God's law, which is a reflection of God's holy character. And we are sinners. We're all sinners. We're born sinners, not because of what we do, not because of what we fail to do or what we do, but because it's just who we are to the bone. I mean, we are born with a sinful nature which enslaves us to a slave master. That's what he's talking about. So look at this. Being a slave to our sin nature means that we can't deliver ourselves. We can't from its power over us. We can't. Today throughout this nation, people everywhere are protesting government and their orders to restrict their freedom to leave their houses so they can go back to work and go back to restaurants and parks and beaches. And Americans love freedom. And amen for that. But what about freedom? What about freedom from their thoughts and desires and habits that bind their hearts from knowing God and pursuing God, you see? What about sin? You can have all of these liberties out there and be in bondage. That's the reality. Verse 35. And the servant abideth not in the house forever. But notice, the son abideth forever. If you're one of those who's been laid off or furloughed, you know that you're not the boss. You know, <laughs> you don't abide forever. You've been, you know. And that, that's kind of what's illustrated here. Slavery to sin is the worst kind of slavery, you see. And as servants of sin, we, we got to look to someone greater than ourselves. To deliver us, slaves have no permanence in the house of their master. They're just slaves. A slave can be booted out at any time. You don't please me anymore, out you go. Right? But not a son. Not a son. By the way, in your, in your, if you have whatever translation you have, English translation, most of them, that, that word son is capitalized. The son, the son, he dwells in the house forever. Why? He is greater than. He is an heir, you see. If the Son, therefore, he says, notice verse 36, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So Jesus claims here, look at this, the authority to be free humans from a curse, the curse and condemnation of sin. He's, he can do it. What we can't do, he can do. We can't free ourselves. We can't release ourselves from this sinful nature, but only, but someone greater than us. And the Bible teaches us that all humans are sinners. We're all in need of a Savior. And Jesus has come. He's going to die six months from this point in our text. Give his life that through faith in him we can be delivered from the power of sin. Rejecting Jesus as the Son of God leaves us in slavery to sin. You deny sin, you can't be saved. You've got to come. The very first thing about coming to Christ, you've got to say yes. You've got to agree with God. I'm a sinner by nature, by choice, and I need a Savior. Well, that brings us to the second lie. Second, there are lies concerning the role of race and religion. These Jews were assuming that their physical descent and their religious practice determined their spiritual heritage. 
or a right relationship with God. That's what they assume. Notice verse 37 and 38. It reads, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but if you seek, but, but, but you seek to kill me because my word, now look at this, my word has no place in you. I, I can't get distracted, but I'm getting distracted because he says, if you're really a believer in God's word, I have a place in you. Are y'all with me? You'll continue. I mean, there's a, there's a resonance for God's word. And, and, and you're not getting it. And you have no desire. My word, the truth has no place in you. Wow. Verse 38. I speak that which I have seen of my father. And you do that which you have seen, which you have seen of your father. So Jesus acknowledged these Jews' ancestry through Abraham. But their spiritual heritage was anything but Abrahamic. Right? I know your daddy and you're not your daddy. Huh? I know your family, but you're not your family. You say you're the children of Abraham? Read it. You're not acting like that. Abraham believed God, didn't he? He acted on his promises that one would arise through his lineage and bless all nations. And Abraham embraced that. I mean... Check out Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. You know where you'll find? You'll find Abraham listed right there. These unbelieving Jews were resisting God. They were attempting to kill God's promised son. That's unlike Abraham. Jesus walked in step with his heavenly father. And guess what? These unbelieving Jews walked in step with their dad too. Their father. And Jesus is suggesting that his father is not their father. Whoa, this is getting really heated. Look at verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Nanny, nanny, you know, (laughs) boo-boo. You just see this back. Oh, yeah, well. Wow. These non-believing Jews thought they were right with God simply because, oh, well, look at me. I'm a child. I'm I'm born of Abraham. I'm of the tribe of. That's what what Paul boasted of. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, and I've kept the law. Keepers of the law. It's all self. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Boasting. I mean, Paul describes these Jews really in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. And I think it, I think it would, uh, best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And I'm going to read this, just that. Just going to read it. Romans 10, 1 through 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they give the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of whose, God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, saying, I am the child of Abraham, I keep the law, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Well, who is that? What does that look like? For Christ, there you go, is the end of the law for righteousness, he said. But everyone, to everyone that believes, wow. Verse 39 through 41 continues, 41a, Jesus says to them, if, look at this, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. I mean, Abraham didn't that. Abraham didn't do that. Abraham didn't reject the truth. Abraham embraced the truth. Abraham didn't reject the promise. He embraced the promise. He he didn't, no, no, no. You do the deeds of your father, he says. Jesus is leading these self-righteous men to a conclusion. Now look at this. That their true parentage, about their true parentage and religion. He's he's getting this down. Verse 41 continues. Then they get back at Jesus. We're not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Now let's just look at this assumption. Let's just put it together. They had assumed that being born as the children of Abraham, now listen, automatically made them the children of God. Now the problem with this is just not true. And by the way, I want to talk about a state church. I read the biography uh, last year, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and uh, he began after his journey... I think he came to U.S. and got saved, basically. But anyway, 
about the non-confessing church. He began to, and he was raised in the Lutheran church. You've got to understand this. A state church. And Bonhoeffer came to the conclusion that there's, there's a confessing church and there's a non-confessing church. In other words, with a state church, I don't, whether it's a Catholic church in Latin America, whether that's the Greek Orthodox Church in Greece, whether that's the Russian Orthodox in Russia, whether that's the Lutheran Church in Finland, whether that's the Church of England, Anglican in the UK, it, it, it creates a non-confessing church. But Jesus lets us know back in chapter 3 that we're not born of the flesh into the kingdom of God, but of the Spirit. So these unbelieving children of Abraham are beginning to see, that Je- see where Jesus is leading them. And they quickly assert that God is their Father. But just because you say it doesn't mean it's so. Verse 42 through 45, And Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, then you would love me. For I proceed forth, came from God, neither came I of myself. He sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you... Now look at this again. You cannot hear my word. Once again, we go back to that opening passage. If you're real, if you're real, then you will love the word. I, I tell our, there's no, that's like this new 21st century generation of Christians. It's just, not a, it's, not a, it's just not a new sort of Christian unlike the others. No, no, no. Christianity is centered on people of the book. Of Christ and his word, period. Reading it, studying it, digging it. You understand? And he says, no, my word has no, no audience in you. You can't hear my word. Notice verse 44. You have your father, the devil. Well, this is getting personal. <laughs> and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, which is what they're trying to do. He abode not in truth, which they can't stand, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he was a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, You just don't believe me. So here we see, we go back to discipleship. Knowledge, right? Knowledge to truth, convictions, to freedom. Not to sin, to pursue Christ, you see. And that truth, that knowledge is not here. I mean, Jesus is letting us know. Now you listen to me. That all the people and religions of the world are divided into two categories. Okay? Number one, those who embrace salvation by grace alone. And not plus anything. Not minus anything. Grace alone. You need to read Romans if you argue with me. You need to read Romans. Here's the second thing. Those who embrace salvation by their own works. Salvation by works. There's the two categories. The first category is authored by God the Father. This is what he's saying. And the second is authored by the devil. You say, well, pastor, that's pretty strong. Well, Jesus is pretty strong here. He says, your daddy's the devil. I don't care if you are the physical children of Abraham or not. Religion and religious works cannot save anyone. We are not made right with God by our physical lineage. A good religion and a good family will lead us and guide us to the truth of salvation. But it can't save us, but it can help. That's good religion. You understand? Jesus draws our attention to our relationship to truth here and to Satan's lies. Jesus speaks the truth, and and, and those who know him, guess what? They have ears for the truth. They have ears for the truth. Uh, the devil speaks lies, and those who belong to him, well, guess what? They have ears for the lies. And it's foolish for the unbelieving world to refuse to hear the truth of God and his word, and it's equally foolish. You get me, listen to this, and I, I'm using myself here. It's equally foolish for believers to listen to the lies of the devil. And we live in a soup of lies. <laughs> we live in a soup of of lies at every turn and if you're not continuing in the truth turning in the word the knowledge of God the truth then you'll end up in bondage 
Here's the third truth, the lie, the third lie. Their lies concerning Jesus Christ. Notice verses 46 through 47. Which of you convinces me of sin? I'm just looking at that. Wow, what a thing. Oh, my goodness. He just called them their father is the devil, and then he asked them, which one, okay, who one of you can convince me of sin? If I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Here we go again. And therefore, you, therefore, what? Hear them not. Because, well, let's draw the line. You're not of God. Wow. Let me just ask you, who can stand before even your friends and say, I've never sinned? What husband can stand before his wife and say, I've never sinned? What wife can stand before her husband and say, I'm perfect, I've never sinned? But think about enemies. Think about your enemies. Jesus boldly stands before them. And he says, who convinceth me of sin? It's interesting because John the Baptist, we had been there. It was Jesus came to the Jordan. He identified Jesus. He says, behold the what? Lamb of God. The innocent Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, how do they respond to this? Do they start naming sins in Jesus' life? Notice verse 38. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, uh-oh, and hast a devil. So here we go. Let's see if this is current in our culture. <laughs> Jesus' enemies never answer his claim. But you know how they respond? Calling him names. <laughs> Does that happen in our culture? People don't want to talk about the issue, so they start calling you names. They don't like what you did, but they don't want to argue it because they can't. So they start calling you names. And going back to this whole ethnic thing and this mixed multitude, you know what these Jews call them? Him? You're a Samaritan. Well, I tell you what. Aren't you glad that Jesus said, I need to go through Samaria, Samaria and I need to sit down by that well and I need, to, I need to reach out to this woman who is a Samaritan. She knew more truth than her own apostles, his own apostles. She got it, man. She got it. Oh, you're a Samaritan. Aren't they exposing their own hearts, their own hatred, and their own bigotry? Calling him names. Verse 45, 49 through 51, Jesus answers, I have not a devil, but I honor my father. You do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Very, very I say unto you, here's another, he said this before, but he's saying it again. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. I mean, Jesus is telling these unbelieving Jews, that they cannot have a relationship with God without having a relationship with Him. Now, he's really going to say this clearly in chapter 14. What does he say here? He says, you dishonor Jesus, you dishonor me, you dishonor the Father. To dishonor Jesus is to remain in your sin, and thereby, guess what? You are dead to God. Verse 52. Then said the Jews to him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Well, for sure we know you're the devil, not us. Abraham is dead. Prophets, eh, dead. They're all dead people. And, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. So these unbelieving Jews remain, as they always have, earthbound in their thinking. I mean, Jesus is telling them that knowing God is contingent upon knowing, believing, and keeping or continuing in his teaching, which is soul-saving, life-transforming truth. Jesus is not speaking of physical death. He's speaking of spiritual death, which is separation from God. Jesus is speaking in terms of eternal life and eternal death, as he did earlier. And he did earlier in chapter 5. And we love this word. We love John 5, 24, and we use it a lot for evangelism. 
But notice what it says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, here we go, and believeth in him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not, shall not come into condemnation, but is already passed from death to life. You see that? He's talking about spiritual death. And also dying to sin, dying to self. Baptism, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the likeness of, his, of, of, of the resurrected life, in the likeness of Christ. And so we have spiritual life, spiritual death. And that's what he's talking about here. But you see, they don't have the Spirit of God. They don't they have no place for it. Verse 53 reads, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who makest thou thyself? These men are asking, who do you think you are? I think we need to remember that six months from the Feast of Tabernacles during Passover, Jesus is going to be accused by these same men. These same Jewish, religious, religious but lost, and they're going to accuse him of blasphemy. And he's going to be turned over to the Romans to be crucified. And by the way, Jesus would die on a Roman cross because of this verse, what he made of himself. What he claimed for himself. Don't let anybody tell you that in the Gospels, Jesus never claimed to be God or never claimed to be the Christ. And COVID. Don't, don't ever believe that because it's the, the Gospels are full of it, especially the Gospel of John. Make no mistake, it. Jesus, he claimed to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world, prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Make no mistake about it. Verse 40, uh, 54 and 55, Jesus answered, if, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. If my fa- that is my Father that honors me, whom say ye that he is your God? Yet you've not known him, but I know him. And I should say I I know him not. I'd be a liar like you, but I know him. And I keep his word. I keep his saying. I I think it's so good that up at the top, he says, if you continue, if you continue in my word, if you continue. And I want you to know that Jesus, whatever he commands us to do, whether it's discipleship or whatever, he does it himself. He he says, "I, I, I live by the will of God, my Father. I will live I, by His Word. He's stating His case that He is one. He's the one and only access to a knowledge of and a relationship with God the Father. It's very clear here. By the way, this same John, the beloved apostle, wrote these words in 1 John 5, 11 through 33. I thought I would just read them here. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. These things I've written to you that you may believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Wow. So there's another lie. That you can have salvation outside of Christ. And there is no salvation outside of Christ. And here's the fourth thing. The fourth lie. There lies concerning the authority of the scriptures. Verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. So here we see the reason Jesus came first to the Jews. See, the Jewish people embraced the promises and covenants contained in the Hebrew or Jewish scriptures. And so these are the people who are most likely or better prepared to recognize and embrace Jesus as the promised Messiah. He came from the pages of the, what we would call the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures. And how amazing that Abraham, Abraham, look at this, saw the coming of the Redeemer. And he believed. Well, we have a Bible, don't we? We have a sure book of prophecy, old and new. It's one book. Abraham believed. He believed in me. And these so-called children of Abraham couldn't or wouldn't. 
Genesis chapter 15, verse 6 says, And he believed in the Lord Yahweh, and he, the Yahweh, uh, counted unto him Abraham for righteous. I want you to know that if you read Romans, this is what Paul does. He takes the big guy in the Jewish world. He takes Abraham and makes Abraham a case for justification by faith alone. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. John chapter 8, verse 57. Then said the Jews unto him, You're not yet, you're not even 50 years old. You, you say you've seen Abraham? That's another boy. That's another um, topic. Once again, we observe that these unbelieving Jews, they're horizontal. They're, they're not, they're earthbound in their perspectives and in their perceptions and thinking. They're, they just, so disconnected from what Jesus is saying. The truth is not in them. They don't have ears to hear the word. Verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now look at this. Here we are. Before Abraham was, what? There it is. There's that tetragrammaton. Uh, There's that, those big, four big letters, Yahweh, right? That phrase, I am. I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He's using this I am as an assertion to be absolute, timeless, and ex coexistent with God the Father. It's a claim to be co-equal, co-eternal co with the God of the he Hebrew Scriptures, the God of the Old Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That's what John deals with right off the bat. See, without doubt, Jesus makes a claim, now look at this, to the authority, to the accuracy, the continuity of the Hebrew Scriptures. In other words, he comes out of the volume of the book. It's written of me, he says. We have a Bible that's trustworthy. We have a Bible that we can know is truth. And we can have it for ourselves. And we love it, don't you? And we want to read it and we want to know it. Because we're the people of God. And we, we want to continue in God's word to get knowledge. So that we can have conviction of truth. And to transform our lives and be set free from our selfishness. and Self-focused in sin and be free to do what? Fulfill yourself? No, to pursue Christ. Pursue Christ. Jesus knew the Hebrew Scriptures. He quoted the Hebrew Scriptures. He often claimed to be the fulfillment of the prophecies, the prophecies concerning the Messiah. You know, when he gets to Passover six months from this point, while he's on the cross, he'll be quoting the Scriptures. And by the way, Largely the Psalms. Someone has made the observation that Jesus was Psalm, P-S-A-L-M, soaked, saturated. He just, and it just came out. And every instance, fulfillment. Verse 59. We got a rock concert. They took up stones and cast at him. They were going to do that. The same like they were with, he challenged them. He that is without sin. But Jesus hid himself, went out from the temple, going through the midst of them, and passed by. So the fact that these unbelieving Jews resorted to violence, picking up stones, calling him names, right? It verified that Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. I mean, Jesus would have suffered death by stoning, right? But he can't. You know, he can't. That's not prophesied. I mean, if you read Psalm 22, you know that Messiah must be crucified. You know. He can't die that way. It's not now. It's not the feast. The feast is Passover. It's not the method. 
It's not the time. And so he walks through their midst. It's not his hour. It's not his hour. As prophesied, Psalm 22, Jesus would be crucified, not stoned. So, wow, what a powerful passage. People who have ears for God's word and people who don't. People who have a heart for truth People who didn't. It doesn't. People who love Jesus. And people who hate him. Let me ask you. Let's affirm we're going to close. Number one. Truth number one. There's no freedom in a life of sin. You know, this is Satan's lie. He, you know, all in America and our capitalism and consumerism and It's over here. This is where it's at. This is where it's at. This is where it's at. You know, wear this, buy this, go here, do that, be like this. You're, you know, it's free. Don't throw off that. It's it's bondage. It's bondage. There is no freedom in a life of sin. Number two, being religious will not get you to heaven. Will not. Three, Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Son of God. Virgin born. And by the way, the scriptures are true. They're true. I mean, you can you can continue in God's word and your knowledge, and you'll develop truth and convictions, and it'll begin to change your life. Hey, also, God is alive and at work in hearts today. I just want you to know. And let's just look at this, all this back and forth. You know what? You say, well, they're talking back to Jesus because they hate him. And they're talking because they're, yeah, but it's also evidence of conviction. He's getting through to them. God's working. And he patiently talks to them. And then you can trust Jesus Christ. You can. Today, right where you are. You know, don't depend on your baptism. Don't depend on the sacraments. Don't depend on being this or that, a Baptist or whatever. Being a Baptist saves no one. It's Christ. And only Christ. Let me ask you this. As we close, are you listening to Satan's lies or God's truth? Are you listening to the world around you Are you listening to the Word of God? And this is where it cuts. And I trust today you can know that you know that you know that you are a child of God. And it is alone by faith in Jesus Christ. If not, you can. God bless you.